Profesor, pues, uh, thank you very much for, for agreeing to, to come to the, to the Quinto Sol Remember Conference. We really appreciate it, and so it's an honor to meet you. And uh, we also want to thank you for accepting uh, to give us this interview on, on your um, further remarks on Quinto Sol and, and, and the literature and the Premio Quinto Sol and Tomas Rivera and Rudy Anaya and the importance of that uh, publishing house for the consolidation of Chicano literature and, and Chicano culture, and also for the possibility of Chicano culture to be studied as such. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can, if you want uh, to begin with general comments. Sure, no, I think it's important uh, this uh, meeting, uh, Quinto Sol remembered, and uh, I was grateful for the invitation. Um, as I said yesterday, I'll refer a little bit to, to yesterday. Uh, um, I never met the people from Quinto Sol. Um, I wasn't here at Berkeley, I was at UCLA, but we certainly did begin to hear about Quinto Sol, uh, you know, down, down there. I left UCLA at, in 68, so just as the movement, you know, was beginning down there, and here with the first uh, Grito you know, that was published here. So um, it was later that, that I came to Quinto Sol when I was a student, a graduate student in Latin American literature at, at UC Irvine. So, so um, removed, but in some way related also to, to what was happening here at, on campus at, at Berkeley. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah. yeah. When did you pick up the, or first pick up Tomas Rivera as in Nostro Agro La Tierra? It was in 1972 when I bought, when I bought the book. I think it um, came out in August uh, 1971. Uh, and I don't know who began teaching it at that time or who purchased the first uh, copies. But I was a uh, 72 a, a graduate student in a master's program at, at UC Irvine. And my professor, Seymour Minton, had been uh, Tomas Rivera's professor in Guadalajara in the uh, National Defense Act uh, Institute uh, there. Um, and he gave me his review of Y no se lo trao la tierra, and I read it. and then. I bought the book there at the at the bookstore at, at UC Irvine. So that's the first time, you know, of my relationship to to Chicano Chicano literature. And I'll use Chicano because there was Chicano at, at that time. You know. What was that experience like? I know you spoke a little bit about that sort of the way the cover was sure. that first edition. So we'll sure. Sure. Well I you know, I um I came kind of late uh, to literature. I, I never took literature in, at UC uh, LA. It wasn't until later that I returned to, to school to mm, begin to think of a, a career in, in teaching without any real idea of what I was going to do later on. Um, and then uh, beginning to read uh, uh, first Juan Rulfo, uh, Pedro Paramo, uh, um, and then after that reading Garcia Marquez, Cien Años de Soledad, and then um, Virtually every every important writer of that that period, including Borges from the past, and all that was um, very eye-opening to me. It, it came about at the same time as the uh, the Cuban Revolution and leftist movements in Latin America. I was aware of all that through Latin American literature and Latin American studies, and then also the you know the Chicano movement. So. Uh, mm, when after the movement, pretty much after the movement, the literature began to appear. And then this, this book that came out in 1971 uh, uh, was, uh, okay, you know, it's finally, uh, there's something in print that we can call a Chicano, a Chicano novel. And um, that's what it seemed like to me. You know, others said it was a short collection of short stories, Seymour. Seymour called it a collection of short stories, Seymour Menton. And so uh, to pick this book up, um, you know, the, the reference about the brown cover wasn't the first thing. It was just opening the book and begin to read and to say, okay, uh, this is it. You know, this is the beginning of, of Chicano literature. And it was a great uh, uh, enthusiasm and interest as to what is it that we were going to begin writing about. and. Uh, what are the themes, what are the topics, you know, what is that, this going to be about, styles. And then obviously it was in Spanish and that was of interest to me and important because I was beginning to read all that literature 
from Latin America, and then to see the obvious influence of Juan Rulfo, you know, in, in Tomás Rivera, and then what he had done with Mexican literature uh, in the United States, in a sense of what I said, that it's a novel that crossed the borders. You know, uh, it, it is Mexican culture, but it's Mexican culture being transformed in the United States. And so, to me, that was important, that this book related to me as a Mexican-American, born on the border, uh, bicultural, bilingual, and almost binational because I could see Mexico from my house. You know, that's, how close, that's how close it was. And then now I'm reading Latin American literature and to have this book then address some of the things that I went through as a, as a, a young boy and as an adolescent growing up on the border, uh, issues of identity, language, you know, uh, resentment, anger, things like that that one goes through. Well, all those were being addressed too by, by Rivera in that, in that book. So it, um, it hit home m m fast and early as to, okay, um, here's someone who took the oral uh, tradition and, and uh, Rulfo's orality and then brought it to, to the United States and make this, this book. You know. So that's, that's what it meant to me at that, at that time. Um, and thanks to Quinto Sol, no, who was able, able to do that. Mm, uh, and it was, what I saw was first rate. You know, the editing, the way that it was put together, uh, the sense of discovery that one had with, with the book. Uh, all that also struck me as uh, important to, to note and the strength of, of the writer. And the, the, yes, indeed, this, this was very, very good writing you know, that we had in this, very first, in this very first novel. So all that you know, is important to me. And the history, that it wasn't the Chicano movement, but what led up to the Chicano movement. Uh, you know, and farm worker culture and laborers. I mean, everyone's a laborer, and the, all the characters are farm workers. I don't know how many novels you have where every single character is a laborer, you know, is a farm worker. Um, and then you put that against the experiences of farm workers in the United States, but the descriptions usually are from outside in English. And so finally here we had someone who was writing in Spanish about his own, about his own experience. And that's, I think that's also um, uh, crosses borders in a sense. For American literature, I think uh, it should have a very important place within American lit and also within, within Mexican literature too. So that, that's what I see. Mexico and the possibility of uh, American studies to open up the, the, this idea of uh, the U.S. as a multicultural place that has allowed for uh, novels like this that uh, engage with Mexican culture on this side of the border. So I'm, I'm wondering from uh, about your perspective, uh, looking at it from also from somebody that understands the politics, uh, cultural politics from Mexico. Uh, what what what? How do you see that unfolding on the other side, on the south, south of the border, I guess? Uh-huh. You know, it's, um, as you know, I live in Mexico City, you know, since 2004. And, um, and so I, I, um, I know Mexico City and, and Mexico and, and the different areas and also uh, different classes and diff different areas from musicians to rappers to intellectuals to uh, professors from, from the UNAM. Uh, I know that there's always been an interest uh, in, in Chicano literature or the culture up here at North. There's a, a Centro de Investigaciones de América del Norte at UNAM. So there are researchers who do uh, work with Mexican, uh, Mexican American culture. Uh, that's mostly in, in uh, history, sociology, especially now Latino politics, that they're very interested in that. Not just California and Texas, but also in Washington, D.C. Um, the preface is that the area in, in literary studies isn't as important to them at this moment in time, but I think in, in, in the future it, it will be. Um, I just had an interview that I told you about with uh, White Rabbit, is the title of the journal, it's an online journal, White Rabbit, uh, Latin Amer uh, English in Latin, uh, in, in Latin America, no, English studies in Latin America. So there's one first. Uh, in general, I'm certain there's others who are going to spring up 
in the future about um, studying you know, uh, uh, U.S. culture, uh, not just the dominant culture, the English-only cu culture, but the cultures in, in uh, the United States. So there's one first indication of uh, an interest in, uh, in, Chicano, in Chicano literature. Um, um, in Mexico, you know, I don't, I don't know right now. Um, uh, those who speak English are usually uh, middle and upper classes, and the middle and upper classes are not necessarily interested in uh, Mexican-American literature. There's a, a class distinction between who we are here, obviously, beginning with Rivera, no farm workers, uh, uh, and uh, um, those who read literature are those who are interested in literature in, in Mexico, you know, and those who read English or are maybe bi bilingual. But it's obvious to me now that everybody in Mexico has to be bilingual. I mean, it's just that's what's going to happen. And uh, the families that I know who are not in private schools but are in, in the private schools in Mexico City, uh, they're all taking English. You know? uh, so the public schools are now teaching English in, in Mexico City. So uh, that's also uh, which something that hadn't or wouldn't happen you know, before. I don't think until until now. So, um, and there have been professors in, in Mexico and in Mexico City who have been interested in, in, in Chicano literature, but you know the criticism hasn't flourished there. I don't I don't think no. But it, it, it's um, as I said, more it's in, in politics and in history and sociology. I was uh, going to mention yesterday too that there are several areas to my presentation. Uh, and one of the areas was uh, on Frontera de Cristal um, by uh, Carlos Fuentes. And a brief introduction to that was the 90s in, in Mexico, where finally uh, Mexican culture in the United States was accepted by the left, no, the left uh, intellectuals in Mexico with Knox that was held in 1998 in the center of Mexico City. I was there for, for that one there, and it, it opened up at the Templo Mayor in the very center of, of Mexico, uh, Mexican identity pre, yeah. Um, 98 is, an, it's an important date, right? It's 1848, you know, the end of uh, the hostilities between the um, United States and Mexico. And, and most people don't know that that war was fought in Mexico, not here in California or Texas. Here the war was over almost immediately. Uh, Mexico was invaded by three, forces that came two from Texas and one from Veracruz and went into the very center of Mexico City and occupied Mexico City. And, and then to have Chicanos, Mexican-Americans come you know, in 1998 and say from Mexican intellectuals, welcome, you know, in that sense. These are the children that were lost in some way from that, from that time. Uh, and then to have Frontera de Cristal come out in 94, just, you know, 95, I'm sorry, my, one year before 1846, and I'm certain Fuentes, being a very smart man, uh, wanted in some way that those dates to be reflected in that book. And I think that book, yes, I, the frame of reference is that war of the 19th century and the emergence of Chicano culture. And the very, very last uh, character is as a Chicano, you know, uh, Jose Francisco, in that book. So those are some indications of. Uh, the acceptance, you know, from uh, at some level from the intellectuals, you know, uh, whether that will happen more in other areas, I, I, I don't know. But to me, those two are important uh, moments, you know, in time. And as I told you also about Madrid Cabecindad, uh, I was going to just briefly say something about that too, that they say Chicano culture is, uh, was a redefining of, of Mexican culture of going back to historical Mexico and Teatro Campesino, the Virgen de Guadalupe, Los Pachucos, all that, and uh, Maldita Vecindad, um, as I say, nuestra búsqueda is the same as la búsqueda de, de, of Chicanos. So there's a combination there, there too. And that's the founding band of rock, and, one of the founding bands of rock and es, español. So there, these are some indications that I have seen. You know, uh, and Frontera de Cristal isn't always seen the way that you know, I see it uh, from that, my perspective as a Mexican over here and a Mexican over there now because I live in Mexico City. So th those are 
some indication. I'm certain there'll be more, no, and more, no. As, uh, I have uh, friends who are professors in different uh, states of Mexico. One professor from Morelia, Michoacán, she goes, she says, no, pues Héctor, la definición de un mexicano es alguien que tiene un pariente en Estados Unidos. Mm -hmm. That's how we're going to be defined now, you know. So, uh, I think it's, as I said, it's going to happen, no? Uh, and the acceptance and the interest, and we can't make everybody read, but sooner or later people will pick up, you know, uh, uh, this literature you know, from the other side of the border. So, okay. so and, and you, you kind of talked about it a few seconds ago, but the beginning of this print culture, uh -huh. right, and how is, how is, and given what you said, how does that reflect, or how is that contributing to what you're talking about? This, how is the beginnings of Quinto Sol, that those first books, uh, contributing to this transition into Sure. Uh, it was mentioned yesterday here, too, the Plan de Santa Barbara of 1969. Um, uh, that's a, a, an important moment, you know, uh, along with uh, Quinto Sol and other moments in, in California and elsewhere. Um, to point out that it was, um, as we saw them yesterday, um, they were young people once. And it's important to point out that it wasn't the administrations you know, of UC or Cal State or anyone. It was young people, young Mexican-Americans who made it happen and then took it back to their respective campuses and made demands, no, because nothing was given at that time. So I think it's important to, to, to point that out, that the, the institutionalization came not from above or saying we need to open this up. It came from uh, young people who were mostly undergraduates. I mean, we really didn't have any graduate students at that time who met uh, in 1969 and devised El Plan de Santa Barbara, which was a whole, uh, um, you know, different steps in terms of uh, institutions, uh, you know, be the, the research center, the teaching part, uh, the community uh, activism part. And all these were uh, part of, of, uh, of Chicano, Chicano studies at that time. So. What is in place today? We owe to to nineteen to nineteen sixty nine. Um, at, at UCLA, I think uh, the Chicano Studies Research Center uh, started in 19, 1970, and it published in nineteen seventy one. Alurista was the first uh, Chicano poet published by a UC uh, institution, the Chicano Studies Research Center, and that was Flori Canto Neslan in nineteen seventy seventy one. Um, Teatro Campesino published their own works in 1971, and then we had, in 1971, Quinto Sol published Y no se la trago la tierra. So for me, that 1971 is a crucial year in which the, the most important poet of the time, Alurista, Teatro Campesino, which began Chicano art, and then uh, Quinto Sol with the first novel. So. The three genres, in a sense, were, were represented, and the three important genres were represented, and uh, uh, each in some way related. You know, Teatro Campesino, kind of their own group, their own foundation. Quinto Sol here at Berkeley, and then the Chicano Studies Research uh, Center doing uh, 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 Alurista. Um, for me, that novel, uh, Rivera, uh, is the first one that looks beyond the book um, to a reader, and this is what I wrote about and what struck me about the book. That, um, while Quinto Sol was thinking about, yes, we have to um, publish, we didn't know what, who we were publishing for, or who was going to read the book. No? But in Tomas Rivera, we have that there's a sense that you're writing for a reader outside of the book who's being invoked as being part of the book. No? Uh, and, and encouraged in some way to participate within the book. And that's, uh, to me, that was uh, uh, important that it, it, it looked towards some sort of uh, group that aspired to some nationalism or national or, or a community in some way. You know? And so that book was looking to the future, not necessarily you know, historical or looking at, at the past. And I think that that with Quinto Sol uh, and the novel um, and thinking about a reader out there and the readership out there uh, that was bilingual uh, and an emergent uh, readership and then the 
the warehousing, if you will, of this literature and these studies within uh, libraries and research centers and the, the beginning of the teaching world, uh, then you're in a completely, completely different area from you know, 1965 and before. Uh, and, and as I said, when you came to the campus, as I did in 1963, there was nothing, absolutely nothing about uh, this important culture, which really gave the Southwest its identity. I mean, if you go to back east, where I lived in C Connecticut, Massachusetts, they have their own identity. But here, ours is clearly Mexican. You know? And so here's the, a culture that gave this area its identity and never being identified anywhere at the university to finally have then these places that one could say, okay, this is the beginning. You know? And as I saw from the Latin American side, who also had their development too here within the United States, it was the Cuban Revolution that made Latin American studies and Latin American literature. So here then is that parallel movement in, in Chicano studies to finally have um, a place where we can go and say, this is the literature, this is the library, these are the courses, no, these are the professors who are going to begin to teach it, and so that's um, a, a new area. I mean, that's print culture, you know, we're in a completely different uh, time from uh, when uh, I was child, adolescent, you know, growing up in the, in the 50s and, and the 60s. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major revolution that we don't always acknowledge it as such, and um, to make know that it was young people, you know, who did that. Mostly working class, you no, know, farm workers, you no, know, kids of farm workers of Mexican immigrants who did that, you no, know, here, uh, as in California, which I know the best, you no. Know. Yeah. So. Uh, earlier, we were talking about uh, the different departments where Chicano literature and Chicano culture is taught or has been taught and how that has been changing over time. I wonder if you can, uh, you know, tell us what you were telling us earlier or something along those lines. Uh huh. Sure, I'll try, okay. Um, as I recall, you know, it, it was uh, within the Spanish departments that uh, a literature um, was accepted in some ways uh, and, and to, be, to be studied. You know. um, and I can think of my own personal relationship to UCI, to UC Irvine at, the, at that time. Um, and professors like uh, Seymour Menton, who was a friend of, of Chicanos, no? um, uh, a friend of Tomas Rivera, who was his professor, um, and that we hired uh, Alejandro Morales, just out of PhD program at Rutgers, to come and teach at UCI. Um, and you weren't seeing that in the English departments. Um, and there were others, you know, I, I can't recall all of them, but it, it, it was the Spanish departments who were the ones that were hiring and thinking about uh, having uh, this literature taught along with Spanish, Spanish American literature. And it was thought of as a kind of a Spanish American literature at the time. Where to include this on this side of the border, you know, where to include uh, Chicano literature. And so it was thought of more at that beginning time, especially with Rolando Hinojosa and, and Tomás Rivera writing in Spanish, they would be more in the Spanish, in the Spanish side. You know, so that was uh, one of the questions in the institution, still today is part of the questions, you know, uh, do English and, and Spanish departments um, um, overlap? You know, do we need to fire one? I think that's part of the <laughs> questions right now. Do we need to fire one because they're doing the same kind of work? You know? Uh, and at that time, uh, it was the, the, the Spanish uh, sections, you know, uh, within uh, the division of the humanities that were teaching this, this, this literature, not, not the English departments. And then with uh, uh, younger students who were trained in, in English and in American studies and uh, American literature, then it began to take more you know, towards, towards the American side. Uh, and understanding, and I'm sure clear to me that mm, you know, that, you know, the East-West relations that we had in the 19th century have to be studied, um, you know, the takeover of Mexico by the United States and how that influence and change uh, transformed uh, New Mexico, Texas, you know. So 
uh, there was work to be done by the English side, and they're still working, still working with that. Whereas um, it seems to me now that the Spanish side has diminished in the importance of what is it, how are we going to uh, direct, you know, uh, Chicano studies or Chicano literature that way. And that the market in the United States is uh, in some ways you know, an, uh, an English dominant market that if you're going to write, uh, you're going to have to write, you're going to have to write in English. Um, uh, the book business is a business and we need to understand that, that too. You're not going to be published you know, if you're not going to sell. You have to sell, otherwise they're not going to publish you. So publishing in English has, 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 become, has become important, and the writers will choose English and write, write in English. Um, there's very few now who actually write in Spanish. No, uh, Rolando Jose is one of, is one of the few you know, who writes, still writes in Spanish. So uh, I think those conditions you know, within, within the academy, uh, the rise of, of, of new um, uh, professors trained in English departments. Uh, the interest of Eastern publishers in publishing now Latina and Latino literature where the Chicano isn't as important as it was before. Uh, and a whole new uh, area uh, um, that one can make some money from, uh, Latino studies or Latina, Latino literature. I think also that, that too uh, reinforces uh, the institution. Um, and, and we work together. You know, they publish our books. And we get tenure, you know. and so that's a revolving kind of a thing of, of uh, where we are in, in our in our universities. That that's the way it, it is. You know. uh, um, so that's that's what I think of what it has has happened. You no, know, uh, with uh, the uh, the language aspect of of Chicano literature. Yeah. Can you also talk a little bit about the? You said what was. What drew these uh, early grad students, early students when they were in university to the Spanish departments as far as the, the foundations for the, like what you were reading uh -huh. and how this sort of contributed to the development of even like you said, Tomas Rivera. Sure, um, and again, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a sociologist, uh, so I don't know at all. What I, what I do know is from uh, the kinds of students that went uh, to UCLA uh, in, in the 60s, and they were working class. Uh, and what I know more is the Imperial Valley, where, I, where I'm from in Calexico. And, uh, of the 50 Mexican-American students that we had at UCLA at the time, uh, 11 were from Calexico. You know. So I know that aspect and who we were and, and what we were interested in. And when we left Calexico to UCLA, we were Mexicanos. And what else would we be? You know? uh, growing up, you were told that you were not American. You know. And then on the other side, you were told that you were a pocho or whatever. But within our families, we were always Mexicanos. So when we went to, to uh, UCLA, uh, you were Mexican, and, and you were looked at as a Mexican. Then in 67, 68, I became a Chicano. And so that connection with Mexico and Spanish was always there, though not of interest to me, you know, not important at all. Well, why would I want to study Spanish? No, there was no interest in that. And then uh, with the Chicano movement and the, the Cuban Revolution, the movements in Latin America, well, then that all began, began to change in my identity or who I was, not just from Calexico and Pearl Valley or California, but in a sense, a, a citizen of a, larger, of a larger area that shared a common history. Well, all that kind of led me to, to begin to read uh, Mexican literature, Latin, Latin American literature. So. Mm, um, as I said before, Chicano literature. This is this is what I was what I was interested in, and uh, there seemed to be at the time um, an enabling and helping from the professors like Seymour Menton or Luis Leal, for example, no, who uh, um, encouraged uh, Mexican American Chicano students no uh, to go to an MA program or even that beyond to a PhD program. And when you think of uh, Rivera and Hinojosa, well, they both did that. You know, they did uh, the PhD programs in Spanish, as I did mine in, in Spanish. So I think in those early years, that was the way you know, to, to uh, uh, be in the academy and, the, and to begin 
um, to study Latin American literature and not Chicano literature because I, I never took a course in Chicano literature. There was no Chicano literature at the time. No. So you begin uh, your career as I did uh, as a specialist in Latin American literature uh, of the boom with a minor in comp lit you know, from Yale. And then over time, well then, it's, a, it's your sense of commitment you know, to where you came from and your roots to say, okay, um, time has come. You know. I'm going to devise a course in Chicano literature. You know. And then that, that changes too. So, um, no, I, I don't know, yeah. Um, my question <coughs> has to go, I, I wanna, I wanna ask you a, bit, a, a question. If you have follow-ups too, so that, you know, if you're looking for what, oh. something that you want, be, that's fine too. Okay, yeah, no. yeah. Uh -huh. oh, okay. uh, so my, my question has to do with uh, genre, genres, and uh, you mentioned earlier the importance of 1971, you know, uh, po poetry being represented and published, and uh, short story slash novel by Tomás Rivera, and then the teatro from the Teatro Campesino. So I was just wondering if you can, uh, Explain to us a little bit about the transformation of the from Menton calling it cuentos. Uh, you quote a letter in your in your book on where El Niño Rios and even Tomás Rivera they were calling it cuentos. Yesterday you mentioned uh, Debajo de las Casas y otros cuentos. That was the original title of uh, No Se Lo Trago La Tierra. So at what point does a novel that is uh, it's that that is introduced or presented originally as a, as a as a collection of cuentos? become a novel, and how does that transformation happen in general, and uh, but also, I'm just speaking for Tomás Rivera, because also it seems that, you know, no, la novela, uh, una novela tiene más prestigio, no, que una colección de cuentos, sort of like, you know, even tradicionalmente, so what, what does that Sure, happen? sure, yeah, you know, um, and I in the introduction to uh, No se lo trago la tierra, uh, it was stated that the collection aspired to a novel, you know, with the identity of the author you know, and the character and the writing that the, the book aspired to be a novel, yeah. Uh, professors make mistakes, and Seymour made a mistake. So, uh, it, it is a collection of short stories, you no? Know, and it is a novel, too. You know. And for me, uh, um, well, there's the term now, composite novel. You no, know, it's a composite novel made up of uh, a string of short stories that are, are related, um, uh, unified by a, a, a character that you can you can identify as someone who's developing, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, with a plot uh, that has a kind of a central you know aspect to it um, from beginning, you no know, middle, end uh, with the an Aristotelian ending, you know, where it comes it comes together a scene of recognition at the end, uh, which takes you back to the beginning. So there's a, a holding together of these stories by, the, by this, this plot. Uh, that it was given to Quinto Sol as a collection of short stories, mm, that's, that's fine with me. I don't have an issue with that. No. That Edmino Rios, who I think was a very smart person, saw that there was something else here besides a collection of st stories and maybe given the Chicano movement, I don't know, I, this is all conjecture for me, uh, thinking that it might be better to give it a sense of unity and a sense of a developing identity within that, which would probably sell better you know, or be read easier in some way where the reader could find himself or herself also within, within the story. Um, so um, I think uh, Herminio Rios saw that too, you know, and uh, began to think about how to rearrange the stories, how to take some out. El Año Perdido was there already. The two ending stories were there. You know, Cuando lleguemos debajo de la casa. So how is it then that I make this a year, and what stories would fit better in the kind of a chronological development? You know, uh, and not necessarily absolutely chronological, but thematically chronological. How can I make it you know, do that? You know? uh, and to his credit, I think, you know, that he's the one who allowed Rivera's writing to become unified and then to become, in a sense, uh, this 
um, composite novel, the first novel, you know, of, of, of Chicano of Chicano literature. Um, that's the way I I see it, you know. And when I wrote uh, my uh, contribution to criticism in the Borderlands about the novel and the community of readers, uh, um, I noted the the parallel conditions with uh, Cervantes you know, and the first Quixote, which is more interesting to me than the second uh, Quixote Part Two, of uh, someone too who is working with uh, narrative and uh, uh, an, an experimental moment between this short story, which novella, which he had already written, written one or two, and then the longer form that we have come to call to call the novel. So at that very first moment of the emergence of the novel in Western Europe, uh, here we had a writer who was working with the same ideas. You no, know, how do I turn short stories into a longer form? You know, uh, and, and how uh, developing that? So it was those interpolations that we have in the first part of the Quixote, uh, and with uh, Cervantes including the reader all the way through, uh, including a community of readers in the first Quixote. Um, and what struck me about Rivera in relationship to uh, Cervantes is the, uh, uh, there are domestic servants and farm workers throughout the book, you know, just like Chicano culture. You know, it's, it's, it's all there and the emergence of uh, a readership, a national readership, and Cervantes was clearly aware of that in a culture that was still very much uh, relying on the oral tradition. So. And also with the emergence of academies too, just like in Chicano culture, you know, and literary critics. You know. Now, I know Cervantes read criticism. You know. So all that to me was uh, those parallel movements. And I said, well, sure, uh, I don't see any problem uh, uh, that Rios or someone at Quinto Sol decided to say, let's make this somewhat different from the collection that he sent us of short stories and give it some unity and then call this uh, Later, no, a novel. So th those are some of the my feelings about about the book. Yeah. yeah. So, so even like having read the pieces that were taken out, so how did those um, just having now that we have all of them? How did how do you feel like you just you can make a, a I guess a venture a guess of like how what it, and Mignon may have been thinking about in relation to these stories and how they disrupt that yeah. unity. I think you. It's been a while since I've, you know, read the uh, uh, Tierra, and uh, since I've worked with it um, in relation to those other those other stories. Um, but I think it's the the child that you're looking for that's developing within within the uh, the book, and if it didn't contribute to that development, that maybe it didn't necessarily fit in. I mean, that's that's the way that that I. I'm thinking of it, of it now, you know, that if a story was well and great by itself, but how would it fit? You know, Rosaura said, those are great stories. Well, yes, they're great stories, but then um, would they fit within within the book and the development of, of the book? And I don't have Pete Fonseca right here in my mind or Salamandra, but I'm thinking of, uh, of Rio saying, uh, how do we keep this child developing you know, within, within, within the book? And keep the head, the sense of uh, cohesion you know, within the book, and all the different aspects that Rivera was writing about in terms of singular identity, the child, you no know, um, family, extended family. How do we keep all that in some way uh, confined you know, to this idea of, of this development that that we have? And he's very clear in the letters to Rivera says, "We're going to take this out and put it over here. We're going to eliminate these two. They don't add to it." Uh, the three central tales are these. We're going to put them in this particular way. Uh, so, um, very clearly, you know, uh, Marmino Rios was, was thinking of the child and the cohesion uh, uh, within the book, and maybe those other stories, as I said, I don't have them clearly right now. They didn't fit into that, that scheme that he wanted for the, for the book. No? Pues le, muchas gracias por sure. estar platicar con nosotros. ¿Alguna de eh, las últimas com últimos comentarios que quiera eh, hacer eh, with respect to Quinto Sol, with respect to the, the work that, that, that uh, 
foundational uh, publishing house uh, did uh, at the time and how it's important in general terms? Sure, you know, it's, it's um, without Quinto Sol, I don't think we would have had others come after them the same way, you know. Um, you can't go back to history and say, oh, you know, reread it, but uh, when I think of, of, of Quinto Sol and the uh, excellent manuscripts that they received, um, we still don't know how many were received. We still don't know who decided finally how we're going to choose the manuscripts under for what, you know, what are the criteria that we're going to decide. But whomever made the decisions, uh, these were like clearly uh, important manuscripts who still I was stood the test of time. No? Uh, when you think of those, the, what they call you know, the Quinto Sol generation, of course, they, they're, they're still there. Um, um, and to think that it was, um, from what we heard yesterday, kids, they were just coming together uh, and saying, we need this and we need that. And then with direction, you know, from a professor, uh, Romano, and then someone else coming in who, Rios, I think, was an excellent reader you know, and, made, uh, and translated uh, Rivera, that first one. I think when you have that um, synergy coming together of, of young people and, and uh, manuscripts that are, are received, then you uh, m publish them, it, it seems to me, in, in the right way with a very high quality of editing that went into those manuscripts. Uh, well, then, uh, Quinto Sol. Um, is that moment, you know, is that moment when Chicano print culture began. You know? Then it was just a matter of time for that to find itself to libraries, to be read by others, and then to, you know, to make the rounds, to finally say, uh, we're all part of this group of readers. Uh, and Quinto Sol is the one, one single thing, not necessarily the Chicano Studies Research Center with Alurista, but it was Quinto Sol in the series you know, when you, once you have that series, then you know mm, there's something very important happening here. Too bad it didn't continue. Uh, you need resources, you need all the funding that you need to continue with that. I mean, that's part of probably what happened too, no? Uh, but yes, to have Quinto Sol, uh, well, it, it's there. I mean, uh, at some point in time, you, you know, a hundred years from now, you're still going to say, this is where it began, no? 1967, no, through 1971, 72, 75, 76, you know, these were the important years of, of the very first, uh, what we come to call, you know, Chicano literature. Okay. Okay, no, de nada, ustedes, gracias.